this uh, this morning the first ENC talk in this session about water air drones. Uh, with us, our presenters today would be from Indonesia, His Excellency Ambassador Jailani, assisted by Vic uh, from the West Houston. Uh, the topic will be the certification and operational requirements for water aerodromes. Uh, also present with us today from Canada, Mr. Patrick Juno, uh, Director of Safety Policy and Intelligence, to talk about Canadian experience with the water aerodromes and seaplane operations. Uh, also with us today from the International Maritime Organization, Mr. Osamu Marumutu, uh, Operational Safety and Human Elements, to talk about the IMO regulatory framework on navigation of vessels with the relevance to seaplanes and wing in ground crafts. Before we go to the presentations, I would like to welcome special guests with us today for the first time uh, in the EC, Mr. Luis Felipe de Oliveira, Director General of Airports Council International, ECI. Luis Felipe, you are very welcome. Uh, do you like to address the, the commission? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's, it's a little, really a pleasure to be here today and uh, participating in these uh, discussions. Um, as you know, uh, ACI represents more than 2,000 airports around the globe, and we work very close with ICAO in, in many areas, especially in safety, uh, technical, environmental, facilitation, security, and of course, we are uh, active uh, in the Air Navigation Commission as well, and we really appreciated the good work that ICAO is doing, uh, led by our uh, president here. And we, as you probably know as well, we don't have any uh, water airports uh, in our membership. That's why I'm interested to see the developments today, and uh, and uh, why not thinking about to have uh, to have a, a also. A, a, airports uh, uh where water airdromes as well as part of our membership and i really appreciate it to see the indonesia that will be the first be the presentation, presentation. Uh, the ambassador jailani will be looking forward to see your presentation of course uh, i have a great opportunity to visit your country um, in different opportunities and uh, uh, one of my most uh, beautiful experiences were komodo island uh, to to Luan Bajo. And, uh, and I really appreciated the, the, that opportunity. So I, thank you very much, Mr. President, for the opportunity to, to be with uh, uh, you today and uh, in, the, in the group as well. And uh, of course, if any future questions, uh, I will be here as well to, to answer. Thank you very much and have a, a great evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. De Oliveira. You are very welcome. And as you know, so the ANC uh, stores are always open also virtually, so they are more open. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so uh, let's start now with the first presentation. Uh, Ambassador Jailani, Excellency, the floor is yours, please. My greatest appreciation uh, for, uh, for having this opportunity to share our views on Water, uh, water aerodromes, and then I am also very much pleased to participate in this specific INC talks. And uh, we find that uh, this INC talk platform uh, is very informative and a very useful tools for exchanging of knowledge and experiences among the states and industries. Uh, to begin with, uh, I would like to. Uh, to uh, to start my uh, my presentation by uh, you a little bit uh, the outline of my presentation and uh, our uh, my I would like to dedicate my presentation to three main themes the first one the background why we need a for global standard for water aerodromes and water operation second I would also try to identify some challenges that we have to address in order to meet the practical needs. Last but not least, this, pres this presentation will also outline some steps that may be considered, may, uh, may be considered as a way forward to realize of uh, uh, such IQ standard. Now uh, we are going to the next slide. 
on the, the background of uh, of why we need such global standard regulation. For many countries, like Indonesia, Canada, and many others, water aerodrome and seaplanes are very important. For those countries, seaplanes may serve as essential mode of transportation. And currently, states develop such mode of transportation individually without any IQ guidance. Some states even have thousands of unregistered water aerodromes that is overseen by civil aviation authorities without, uh, without guidance from IQ. The lack of use to a protocol related to certification of water aerodromes, apron, marking of runway, and taxiways and visual signs also create practical challenges for further development seaplanes. Now, the next slide. Um, I just want to refer to what the assembly has done previously. In the last session, the assembly instructed the IQ Council to review the existing subs related to aerodromes and to develop specific standards and recommended practices to address the design, certification management, safety, and reporting requirement for water aerodromes operation. Therefore, the Air Navigation Commission may consider establishing appropriate forum to develop such global standard. Now, we're going to the next slide. Uh, I just want to share with you uh, the typical water aerodrome. As you may know, Indonesia has long, long recognized the importance of water aerodromes and its continued development. Our, in our aviation industry is a leader in, in a seaplane. And then, according to ITA, ITA and Eurocontrol, Indonesia is expected to be the third largest travel market in the 2030. This excludes seaplanes operation, which are not under IATA umbrella. In the next slide, I'm, I'm going to focus on the benefits of seaplanes uh, development. We know that they are the best mode of transportation for archipelagic countries and remote islands. Seaplanes play a major role in disaster relief and emergency evacuation. It is also an economic driver for small island developing state and other countries that depend on heavily on seaplane operation. This include business travel and tourism with recreational access to very remote destinations. In the next slide, you can see some uh, some pictures of seaplanes. As you can see in this slide, seaplanes come with a view variation. One of the example is Canadian electrically powered auto aircraft, which flew in 2019. This unexpected mark, this unexplored mark. All these aircraft require a water aerodrome with all its facilities to operate. Now we go to uh, the picture of larger seaplanes. Seaplanes are not limited in size. This, uh, uh, this Russia, Russian and Chinese aircrafts are currently operational for serving international routes. Now allow me to go to the next slide. Um, on the challenge, on the need for global standard or regulation. It is inevitable that state must certify water aerodromes open to publics and these procedures differ from state to state. And there is an urgent need to harmonize procedures globally. In addition, there are currently no guidelines for seaplanes, docks, ramps, and other supporting as well as 
search and rescue facilities. Moreover, a state imposed water aerodrome licensing requirements need to be harmonized globally. The regulation of water aerodromes will also require new safety requirements. The next slide is about the basic standard in currently used by several states. In this slide, I give you more perspective on some common standard currently applicable in several states. It includes, among others, water runways, number of orientation length of water runways, width of water runways, which is around 60 meters or 197 feet, a water runway strip of 30 meters or 100 feet, and a taxi channel or known to us as a taxiway with a width of 45 meters or 150 feet. There are, of course, some basic standards that appear in the slide and can be used as a practical reference in the future work of INC. Now, in the next slide, um, I'm going to address the issue of different rules governing siblings. Under IMO provision, seaplanes are considered vessels when operating on the water or flying before 150 meters. However, the TOLAS convention specifies that any craft capable of flying outside the influence of ground effect at an altitude of more than 150 meters shall be subjected to IQ rules and regulation. This means that in practice, seaplanes will have to operate on a marine radio frequency whilst on the water, an aviation frequency in accordance with an extent on aeronautical telecommunication of the Chicago Convention once they are airborne or flying an altitude of more than 150 meters. It must be practically challenging to maintain awareness in split frequency and totally different radio operation. In the next slide, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit on another challenge with respect to water aerodrome operation. All seaplanes are considered vessel or boats while operating on water and are subjected to marine rules governed by state maritime, maritime authorities and while in airborne above 150 meters, and it falls under civil aviation standard governed by the civil aviation authorities. Another complication is a different speed. A vessel speed in harbor is 10 knot, and you mix that with aircraft with landing or takeoff speed that is much higher. In addition to those issues, water aerodrome specialists are not necessarily expert in land aerodromes and vice versa. Let's go to the next slide. You can see the typical international water aerodrome. Before I before proceeding to our recommendation, can can uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah? Uh, before we uh, proceeding to our recommendation and way forward, I want to show you the typical operation of water aerodromes as indicated in this public port of Victoria traffic scheme. We can see the complexity of traffic as well as mixed operation of vessels and seaplanes in this busy port with different frequencies. Seaplanes sharing the same runway with large vessels while smaller vessels operating next to the runway combined with the recreational vessels and kayak crossing the runway with no communication. This is a completely different world compared to land aerodrome where every moment in the air is highly controlled. The next slide is about a water aerodrome emergency plan. The same situation also occur in the emergency plan. Seaplane operation poses different type of hazard compared to regular aircrafts. Some of the hazard include factors such as that passenger evacuation 
take place in water, which is much more life-threatening because we deal with the quick onset of hypothermia and associated effect, including drowning. Also given in, the, in a sibling, the fuel floats on water, the immediate toxicity, toxicity and respiratory effects on survivor in the water is extremely high. Therefore, we think that water operation needs different water aerodromes emergency plan that focusing on water rescue and fire responsing response training. On the next slide, uh, we will see that there are some challenges led us to one simple conclusion. That is, we need a global standard regulation for water aerodromes so that all states can have international guidance that promote a higher level of safety efficiency and regularity in operation. We believe that additional standard or regulation will also be required for ATC training as a different skill set is required and IMO rules must be clearly defined in this process. Can we go to the next slide? I'm going to talk about the way forward that we can foresee. As I mentioned earlier, in this presentation, I would like to outline some steps that may be considered by ANC as a way forward. It is recommended that ICO establish special coordination to address this issue with IMO. As a council member, Indonesia is committed to support this endeavor. Establishment of a special panel of the ANC will be also highly recommended. It can be foreseen that a special specialized panel of the INC to prepare SOPs for water aerodrome. In this regard, we also think that since states will provide expert to the panel at their own cost, the development of these SOPs will not incur additional cost to IQ other than the cost of the secretary of the panel. Now we go to the next slide. Uh, this is about the issue needs to be considered for SAPS development. Solution need to be found to make it a seamless operation between the air and water use frequency as seaplanes are subjected to the IQ standards and IMO regulation on water. This is also very important as land airport standard and regulation currently exclude a water aerodrome. The next slide, please. And um, development of new water aerodromes by panel established by ANC will require very specialized expertise. In this regard, Indonesia can contribute with its resources and expertise in the development of SARPs. Other states such as Canada, Maldives, and maybe others who are very familiar with water aerodromes may also provide their respective expertise or contribution. And uh, the next slide, in this last slide, I'm elaborating further issues that need to be addressed. Uh, you know, due to a uh, time constraint, I don't want to spend much more time to retreat those issues. You just can see here in this slide, things need to be taken into account to move forward our work on water aerodrome. I will be very appreciative if the Secretariat also distribute this presentation to INC members and participants of this meeting for their perusal. I think Mr. President, I should stop my presentation here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Jailani, for this very good presentation. Yeah, uh, I am looking for, for the uh, discussion later in the Q&A session. I, uh, I think there are many very good points that you have highlighted now. Uh, of course, based also on the last assembly resolution, we have the A48. 
uh, discussing this very innovative uh, issue. And I have noted that your country uh, is willing to, to help the ICAO and the IMO together to work on the development of new SARPs. It's always good for us as commissioner to hear that uh, we have the support of the states for our work. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to invite the next presenter, and we will come later after the three presentations to the Q&A. Uh, the next presentation is uh, made by Patrick Junot, Canada. Thank you, President. Uh, can we pull up the presentation on the screen? Nadia, please. Just taking a moment. No problem. Perfect. Thank you. So thank you, President. Thank you, members of the Commission and all those in attendance for the opportunity to present today. I'll be talking today about water aerodromes in Canada. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Perfect. I'll give a brief outline of what I'll talk about today. Um, the first part will set the context that runs the international obligations and, and the needs that are, exist. I'll talk about it from the perspective of a focus on safety, talk about the Canadian context, and speak to the work that Canada has done on Canadian standards for water aerodromes, and speak to the how we would move forward as well. Next slide, please. So under the guise of no country left behind with ICAO, we recognize the fact today that there are thousands of unregistered water aerodromes in existence. There's an established need for global standards, both for water aerodrome certification and for seaplane operation as well. And to do so requires specific expertise in water operations. As the previous speaker spoke and, and His Excellency outlined, it's also a major economic driver for small island developing states, as well as many other states out there as well. Next slide, please. So in 2019, at ICAO's 40th Assembly, uh, we saw international leadership for safety coordination across the board from all member states that attended. Um, in partnership with Indonesia, Canada and Indonesia presented Working Paper 94, which led to, as you outlined, Assembly Resolution 48. With the Assembly support for the development of global provisions for water aerodromes as well, that would speak to the design, certification, and management, safety and reporting requirements for water aerodrome operations. Next slide, please. When we look at Annex 6 and Annex 14, ICAO Annex 14 defines that an aerodrome can be an area of water. It doesn't differentiate between land and water as a surface from which aircraft can operate. We find that under the licensing criteria as well. And ICAO Annex 6 acknowledges that there are different operational requirements for seaplanes versus land plans. Licensing factors for water, for water aerodromes to differ from land aerodromes primarily include the physical characteristics of the operating environment, the mooring procedures, and rescue firefighting services. However, one fundamental licensing criterion that requires the license holder to establish and maintain an appropriate SMS remains the same. The criteria should therefore be considered in addition to the criteria outlined elsewhere in Annex 14 that apply to land and water aerodromes equally. And there are different operational and safety risks when operating onto and from water, ensuring that those are recognized. Next slide, please. So with a focus on safety, we talk about water aerodromes or water operations on water differ significantly from those on land due to physical characteristics, mooring procedures, rescue and firefighting, and the risks associated with egress and drowning. And so as such, we are charged with, when we look at this, looking at the nexus of air and marine issues as well, which will be some of the subject today. There are also specific needs and safety needs around traffic management. And also when we look at the enroaching waterfront land development and the interaction that we have with local authorities, municipalities, et cetera. Oh, hang on a second. I'm having a minor issue here. Just a moment, please. Oh, 
Apologies. So there are distinct requirements for land and water. So the current ICAO SARPs that apply to land aerodromes speak to the slope of the ground, the size and color of markings painted on the pavement, the load bearing capacity of the pavement, and the location, color, and size of signs. These are a few examples now of how there are differences between land and water aerodromes and the need for distinct and standardized specifications. So for water aerodromes, we have to speak to things like the fact that the landing surface changes with the rise and fall of the tides and the speed and direction of currents, that maritime markings and buoys are used in those contexts, that surface or submerged hazards such as shoals and log booms exist, and that, there are multi, that these areas, ports, are multi-use where you see aircraft, vessels, and recreational boaters interacting in that same space. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what you see on the slide here speaks to the top 10 events at water aerodromes in Canada. You see, and I know the writing may be a little bit small for your screens, but essentially there is nothing here that is unique to water aerodromes when we talk about safety issues relative to land aerodromes. The same issues exist. And so the, that we see these types of issues around the, um, controlled airspace, unauthorized entry, uh, issues around overshoots and missed approaches, um, these types of things speak to the need for an equivalent level of safety to that required at land airports as well. And the standardization of international specifications is especially important. It's what we've done for a long time for land aerodromes through ICAO, and it's what we need to be looking at doing for, sea, uh, for water aerodromes as well. In Canada, most water aerodromes are used by operators to provide transport within the country. That said, in other parts of the world, Southeast Asia, for example, seaplane transport is moving passengers from one island nation to another where the safety standards may be different. And we know that that difference in safety standards is often what creates safety issues down the road as well. Next slide, please. So we'll focus on safety. So aircraft operations, as I was saying, differ significantly from those on land, due to physical characteristics, mooring procedures, and rescue and firefighting. There needs to be a recognition that there are unique characteristics of land versus water operations to be accounted for. The safety of seaplane operations comes at that nexus of air and marine transportation. Not only are operations different, but we also know that waterfront property in many areas around the world is sought after. What we've seen in Canada particularly for both land and water is commercial and residential development around existing aerodromes has created additional safety concerns. For examples, through obstacles such as cell towers, condominiums, and other things. Conflict also may arise related to recreational use of water, uh, of waterfront land, and of water. And we often see within Canada a lot of concern from communities and a need to have standards and ways in which to manage that around noise, air, and water quality as well. Next slide, please. So within the Canadian context, we have a piece of legislation called the Aeronautics Act. Um, somewhat akin, if you will, to the, uh, yeah, the Aeronautics Act. We then have the Canadian Aviation Regulations Part 3. And we also look at the Canadian Marine and Shipping Act as a result of this nexus between air and marine. And a seaplane itself is deemed to be an aircraft from the point of initial intent for takeoff until it comes off the step on landing and is considered a vessel when maneuvering in water. Next slide, please. So when we speak to the Aeronautics Act and our guiding legislation in Canada, we speak to an aerodrome as any area of land or water, and recognizing that Canada can be very cold, as many of you have learned in Montreal. This includes the frozen surface of water as well, or any other supporting surface used, designed, prepared, equipped, or set apart for use either in whole or in part for the arrival, departure, movement, or servicing of aircraft and includes any of the buildings, installations, and equipment situated thereon or associated therewith. Next slide, please. As a result, we've looked at and have worked on within Canada on certification requirements. We find those in, in the Canadian aviation regulations. We speak to the fact that an aerodrome that is located in the built up area of a city or town requires to be certified, or a land aerodrome, a scheduled surface for the transport of passengers, or any other aerodrome the minister is of the opinion that it is in the public interest to certify as well. Next slide, please. And so we looked at enhancing water aerodrome regulations. 
And a lot of the work here was based on recognized safety parameters. So ensuring a minimum level of safety for scheduled passengers, so ticket holders, the highest volume of traveling public. Ensuring a minimum level of safety for third parties, the general public that also use those spaces and around. We wanted to see the consistent application of safety requirements for the same types of activities from all aerodromes, be they airports, heliports, or water airports. And again, we also have to look at the future potential for global navigation through satellite systems and those approaches in the future as well. We see a lot of mixed operations between VFR and offer and IFR operations in populated areas with different types of aircraft operating in marginal weather at times. Vancouver Harbor, Sea Island, Nanaimo and Victoria Harbor all have mixed operations in Canada. These water aerodromes all have scheduled passenger operations approximately every 15 minutes or less, and I'll speak to that in the next slide. High movements of these aircraft also implies more coordination in the same environment at the same time and more aircraft taxiing, taking off and going through the landing phases as well. Increased seasonal marine traffic mixes with float planes, sometimes forcing float planes into unprotected waters as well. Next slide, please. Can we go to slide 13, please? There we go. So we've already spoken of Victoria Harbor a little bit, but I, I wanted to draw it back to this um, and speak to when you look at a, an operation like this, the traffic management issues that come into play. We have aircraft and vessels operating in the same lanes to access the inner harbor at Victoria. Uh, around the Victoria Harbor, we have encroaching land development as well. And so all of these issues come to a head in a place like Victoria Harbor. Uh, next slide. And Victoria Harbor is a certified water airport. On average, we see 100 flight movements per day, and it's a multi-use port. There are cruise ships, seaplanes, passenger ferries, and recreational boarders that all move through that space. It's also the busiest port of call for cruise ships here in Canada. Next slide, please. And so you can imagine the need for us as a country to look at these things, and, and there are other places I can draw attention to within Canada, but there needs to be something around this. And so in Canada, we've, we've gone through several iterations of this around the evolution of Canadian water airport standards. In 1986, we talked about water airports that had applicable criteria that were contained in a standard. Um, in 1996, when we created the Canadian Aviation Regulations, some of that was lost a little bit. We, we went to a standard that really only spoke to land aerodromes, but we had these vestiges and these existing aerodromes that still existed and needed to continue to operate as well. And so op water airports were continued to operate under the existing previous standard that addressed water and ice aerodrome standards. In, two, in 1999, uh, Victoria Airport surrendered its certificate in anticipation of new regulations. Um, other airports in Canada did not. Um, and we've continued to work with them and continue to advance within our own internal rulemaking within Canada to bring forward a set of solid uh, water aerodrome standards for our operations. And in 2019, that led to a notice of proposed amendment that went out to talk about those and what we were hoping to bring forward. Next slide, please. The goal of those draft Canadian standards for us and all the work that has gone on in the past 20 years in developing those standards for Canada has been to increase the level of deeper passengers, crew, and populated areas surrounding a water airport. We also want to ensure effective and safe takeoff and approach areas, maneuvering areas, and that landing sites are adequate for the intended operations. This really proposed process is for what we're doing in Canada, um, but we've provided and received comments on the proposed amendment regarding aerodromes, and we're moving towards uh, a final rulemaking process here in Canada as well. So I'll give a quick overview if you go to the next slide. Thank you. So the Canadian standards, we talk in here about quantifiable requirements. We talk about physical characteristics and dimensions that are necessary. We talk about qualitative requirements. So the content of emergency plans, uh, personnel, training. We make references within these draft standards to maritime requirements and compliance to, with Canadian aids to navigation as well. We also speak to emergency planning. And that's a piece that within the current pieces, the, the grandfathered existing standards that proponents operate under, that doesn't exist yet. And that's something we need to bring in and have identified the need to bring in as well. Next slide. This gives a sense of what these standards encompass. We talk about personnel and what the water airport operator is. We talk about units of measurement and how we manage those in that context. We talk about airport data, physical characteristics, 
obstacle limitation surfaces and objects, visual aids for navigation, visual aids for denoting obstacles, visual aids for denoting restricted use areas, and emergency planning, which is especially important when we refer back to the number and types of incidents that occur and the ability to anticipate, plan for, and respond to these types of incidents. And as I outlined before, what exists for land aerodromes doesn't necessarily work for a water aerodrome as well. There are unique characteristics that need to be addressed. So next slide, please. Under personnel responsibilities, we talk about that a water airport operator shall ensure safety by exercising operational control, coordinating functions and ensuring regulatory compliance, for example, maintenance, uh, supervising, organizing, and staffing, docking, refueling, passenger safety, training programs, knowledge transfer of safety information, and SMS. Is responsible for liaising with regulatory authority and external agencies, for distributing accident, incident, and other occurrence reports, and actioning aeronautical information. Is responsible for the qualifications of staff and appropriate delegation of duties, and maintaining a current water airport operations library. Next slide, please. When we talk about units of measurement, as, as banal as that may sound, um, except as specified, the elevations have to be to the nearest foot, linear dimensions to the nearest half meter, uh, coordinates and latitude and longitude to the nearest second, bearings to the nearest degree. These things are things we're familiar with, but then we also have to contend with water depths to the nearest foot or meter and tides as they're measured with respect to the lowest normal zero tides, because these tides will impact and affect those surfaces and the safety of that area as well. Next slide, please. When we talk about airport data, because of the tides and the shifting, we have to figure out ways in which to do these things. We have to talk about the geometric center being to the nearest one-tenth of a second. The water airport elevation and magnetic variation is going to be subject to tide condition and variations as well. Um, electric navigation aids, so elevation of the antenna or the radiating center and the geographic coordinates to the nearest one-tenth of a second. Uh, universal navi uh, navigational signal, the ILS localizer course, the dimensions of the water airports itself, the physical characteristics, the markings, and the significant obstacles on it in the vicinity. We, we have to consider all these aspects, but consider them in a context where we have a moving body of water as well. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. When we talk about the, auto the operations manual, the water aerodrome would contain, among other things, the physical characteristics, water airport boundary, the level of service and types of services that would be provided, including emergency services, critical aircraft that is intended to operate at that water airport, which influences the infrastructure and, and what needs to be present, the organizational structure, the SOPs, and any agreements or memorandums about the operation, including, again, emergency services. It's similar to what we find, but needs to be specific to water airports because of those considerations as well. Next one. Thank you. So again, going back to Victoria, and again, I apologize, the image is quite small here, but we talk about the channel, that it's 800 meters long by 120 meter wide. The water depth is at a minimum 1.8 meters, but that changes, again, depending on the tides. That the width of taxiways, ramps, the size of turning basins, that we identify and indicate very clearly the shore facilities, the docks, the wharfs, the ramps, and the beach. Next slide, please. When we talk about obstacle limitation surfaces, you know, take off and approach and landing, straight in, offset, curved, one directional. These things that define the limits to which objects may project into the airspace um, are going to vary accordingly as a result of the water aerodrome context. And it's important to distinguish from obstructions in the water, which are managed differently. In Canada, that's the Coast Guard or the Port Authority, but they still need to be accounted for for safety reasons because they have an impact on aviation safety. Next slide, please. When we talk about visual aids for navigation in a water aerodrome context, you know, we talk about and things some pilots are familiar with, wind engines, um, but then we get into things that are different. When you talk about markings, you're talking about docks and marker buoys, uh, the location and way in which we have to do signage, strobe lights. These things are going to have to be different for a water aerodrome operation. You need that standardization around these pieces as well for that to work. Um, because taking off from one country, landing into another water aerodrome, if everything is different each and every time, we introduce the, the ability for air and we create the environment in which safety interrupts as well. Next slide, please. So other visual aids for denoting obstacles, the use of cards, markers, uh, for denoting restricted use areas. Again, these things need to be standardized. They need to be predictable from one place to the next. 
Next slide, please. So the water airport emergency plan. We have to have, through risk-based analysis, preparations for aircraft accidents or incidents within or outside the water airport boundaries, for water rescue, which differs significantly from land rescue, for fire response. Again, you're not dealing with a fire on a land surface. You're dealing with a fire on water sometimes and a fire that can move. Um, oil, fill and oil spills, fuel spills, how do we manage those? Uh, the recovery of aircraft from the moving area. Uh, how do we deal with trauma and injury to passengers or personnel and medical emergencies in an environment that's quite different and moving? Um, we have to make sure that we're consulting identified agencies, that these are reviewed and updated annually. Uh, in the Canadian context, we'll be conducting a test of the plan every three years. But again, when you compare what happens and what exists for land aerodromes, the water aerodrome and the water airport context is, is quite different. Uh, the environmental considerations come into play and all these other things that are things that we deal with on land, but they vary dramatically when you're dealing with water in a very different environment. Next slide, please. Um, when we think about there we go. Um, when we think about the emergency equipment that has to be available, um, again, this changes because you're no longer talking about the same types of things. They have to be readily available at the docking site. But we're talking about life rings and barge poles for water rescue. We're talking about fire extinguishers that can put out fires, but that can put out fires potentially on water that aren't the same. Having absorbent material for an oil and fuel spill that works on water and the ability and the training and the personnel to be able to use these things. That we have safety boats on hand. Uh, for passenger rescue and to deal with safety issues as well. Next slide, please. And within the Canadian context, we, other require, we have other requirements coming in because we've been working on this for, for 20 years now, easily, um, where we're bringing life vest requirements for all passengers and pilots. Uh, we're looking at and bringing in emergency egress training for pilots. That A pilot that operates in that environment, especially when you're talking about smaller aircraft, uh, these aircraft have tendency when they, when they have an accident on water to flip. And so there needs to be training for those pilots on how to get passengers out of that aircraft safely. Uh, make sure that the passengers have life vests with them as well, because usually that's the leading cause. Is you can sometimes get the passenger out of the aircraft, and they may drown as a result while they're waiting for rescue. Or more importantly, sometimes the pilot, in a completely disoriented situation when you land on water, um, if you're talking about an aircraft that's flipped, um, all your bearings, all your, your references are completely flipped. Everything that's up is now down. And you need training and for those people to be ready to evacuate people in that type of environment. On larger um, aircraft, that's an issue that applies aircraft the way in the way in which an aircraft lands. Um, it's led us to a lot of uh, rulemaking with some multiple investigation. And these need to think and talk about seaplane operations in general. We have a lot of experts we can bring to the table in terms of the dining trying to address some of these issues already. So next slide, please. Board um, Canada as a country is, is ready to support no country behind initiative, expertise, and all the work that drafts existing rules, work that we do the country here as a starting point for ICAO. Uh, we recognize what goes into starting a SAR uh, work to doing these things. And we think we have a lot of work that we to bring this file and help accelerate the pace of work on this piece on and, and offering it up to the international community to build on and develop and adapt into an ICAO context as well. I also welcome the opportunity to participate in it, working towards the development of a comprehensive international SARPs for water aerodromes as well. Next slide. So thank you. Um, and I turn the floor back to you, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, very much, Mr. Juno. Uh, very comprehensive, very good uh, presentation as well. Uh, let's now go to our last presentation today. Mr. Ustamo, media co-host, you should be able now to share your desk.
good afternoon again um, from London. Um, I hope you can now see my slide. Uh, could someone respond to confirm that uh, you are? Yes, you... yes, Mr. Osama, we see, we see your presentation. Okay. We hear yeah, you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you once again. Um, well, again, Mr. President, um, I have to admit that everything that I have been observing um, from um, today's um, video conference is, is almost new to me. Uh, me, as someone who has had some experience serving on board the ship as Master Mariner, um, but I haven't actually come across to these uh, um, aerodromes uh, or even the seaplanes uh, discussion in, in these details. Uh, but so thank you once again for the previous presenters. Uh, that's very, very, in a way, educational to me. And from that perspective, uh, what I'm going to offer to you to this meeting is, is going to be limited to extent to the procedural aspect, as I am hearing that there are certain um, expectations amongst the ICAO membership that uh, perhaps the international regulations, uh, guidance, uh, recommendations, um, even with the joint um, initiative between ICAO and an IMO may be needed. And, and I hope I'll be able to assist uh, with this. Um, just a very brief introduction, let me uh, introduce the IMO, uh, as I understand that um, not all of you are familiar with this entity, that's a so-called sister agency of the United Nations, um, along with ICAO, we do um, um, work closely for certain um, subjects, such as rescue and investigation, common um, interests um, uh, 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 exist. Um, we do have 174 member states, including Canada, Indonesia, of course. And, and um, unlike ICAO, uh, IMO basically has one office, that is the headquarters, the global headquarters in London, without any uh, um, branch offices. There are um, a few uh, regional coordinators stations uh, um, in, in critical locations around the world, but uh, that is it. Basically, almost everything is, is taking place in London uh, before this pandemic um, um, taking place. Of course, nowadays, the IMO meetings are conducted in, in virtually, and, and uh, uh, we see the increased uh, participation um, of basically the um, delegations and observers participating um, from around the world. Um, right. Um, obviously, the objectives of the organization. Oh. And the um, merchant marine, the IMO is, is it's basically like ICAO, a technical organization, and 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 the objective is, is safety and security, pollution prevention, and facilitation of maritime traffic. And we do have, um, I think it is currently 53 mandatory treaty instruments, including uh, the um, some of the conventions which uh, we have just heard, like SOLAS and collision regulations and so on. Um, with the mission statement, um, safe, secure, and efficient shipping on cleaner, cleaner oceans. So on under which um, we do um, operate. Um, out of 53 treaty instruments, um, some of the major uh, um, conventions, such as SOLAS and, and, and the COLLEG, um, although in terms of number of, of contracting government or state or parties may somewhat be limited, but in terms of the coverage of the merchant fleet of the world, um, SORAS Convention, for example, is applicable uh, to 99.04% of the world tonnage. So it's quite significant. 
and, and similar figure, uh, 99.03 percent of world tonnage um, of uh, applicable to um, 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 the collision regulation. Um, decision making, indeed, in IMO is, is prerogative of the membership, and and uh, again the assembly, the highest um, organization like. IKL, as I understand, uh, which is attended by all 174 member states, as well as three associate members, and and um, they meet every two years. Between the sessions of assembly, the, the uh, 40 members of elected council member uh, make an important decisions, and and uh, under this structure, we have five committees. And talking about the uh, operation of um, seaplanes and aerodromes, most likely the uh, most relevant um, uh, committee is the Maritime Safety Committee, which has um, um, some um, several uh, subsidiary subcommittees. And I have highlighted um, the one called NCSR, that is Navigation, Communication, and Search and Rescue. Uh, considers uh, um, the basically that is it navigation issues as well as communication and search and rescue issues as mandated and in a way controlled by the maritime safety committee. Um, I guess this is pretty much similar and it is quite universal, so there's no need for me to introduce. And I'm certainly not um, trying to, to, to educate in any way. It's just a summarize of, of what we have as an IMO regulations and, and uh, recommendations. And of course, the convention is the highest um, um, of all, uh, which governs the maritime safety and environment related um, um, regulations to those uh, contracting parties and uh, um, IMO member states, um, including, of course, the examples of the collision regulations and, and SOLAS convention. And uh, next, the codes. It could be a mandatory code, and it could be no mandatory code. Uh, and this, of course, uh, sometimes uh, is, is uh, endorsed by the convention to become also uh, the mandatory instrument, um, but in many ways, uh, it is giving the member states the um, um, guidance and, and recommendations and sometimes uh, requirements um, um, on the codes. And, and these conventions and calls uh, um, normally um, amended quite regularly and, and the IMO is producing uh, um, guidance and, and recommendations uh, quite regularly and also updating these decisions uh, normally uh, adopted by the uh, committees as well as assembly level uh, disseminated by the document called resolution and all other in, um, um, recommendations and uh, non-mandatory instruments are uh, um, approved by committees and, and again and disseminated um, by means of circulars. And those um, examples, which I would just briefly explain later, is, is one of the um, MSC, the Maritime Safety Committee Circular 1592 which gives the guideline, guidelines for winging ground, or in short, wick craft. Um, let me just start from um, um, the um, brief introduction on the collision regulations, what we uh, call it in short. Um, the important and relevant um, information can be found in the very fast rule that is application and this indeed is is applicable to all vessels upon the high seas and in all waters connected therewith navigable by seagoing vessels and um, 
this, this although uh, of course this this is in principle intended to regulate the ships um it's it is not just ships that is being regulated it is a vessel and vessel could mean even broader than that which i will explain later that uh, that also includes seaplanes seaplanes are considered to be vessel uh in in terms of um uh, collision regulations whilst they are basically floating on the water um that needs to be um strictly uh, complied um upon um, there are some certain relevant rule in rule two responsibilities, and there are certain um, um, uh, irregular, if you like, uh, circumstances uh, exist where the, the ship's captain need to make a decision on um, quite unusual situations, such as a ship plane approaching to you um, um, from from. Um, you know, um, um, from in front of you, what to do? Um, that uh, there are um, a certain recognized practice among seamen, we call ordinary practice of seamen, and special circumstances. Uh, these uh, provisions are provided in Rule Two and Rule Three. Again, uh, this is a definition um, talking about vessels. This uh, includes non-displacement craft and weak craft and seaplanes. So these uh, um, crafts capable on, on flying, uh, but capable on, on floating of water and capable also for maneuvering on water are considered to be vessel, along with the definition of seaplane and weak craft. And the one that is probably most relevant that I have highlighted in red uh, is the responsibility between vessels. A seaplane on the water shall, in general, keep well clear of all vessels and avoid impeding their navigation. So that's the basic principle that uh, we do expect. We, um, I would say, mariners, seafarers, seamen, they do expect that the seaplane will, will will keep clear of, of the vessels. Um, that needs to be understood by uh, anyone who maneuver the, the sea planes and, and the weak craft. Otherwise, uh, there could be an issue. Um, also, there are some relevant um, provisions requirement for the weak craft and uh, talking about the uh, well, collision regulations, uh, because there are so certain hierarchies, if you like, um, for navigation rules, uh, which one needs to avoid the, the other one. Um, for that reasons, uh, uh, vessels are expected in general to exhibit uh, lights and shapes of char characteristics in the positions uh, and, and there's a um, prescribed positions in, in the colleg uh, itself and and, uh, and recognizing the unique uh, nature of these uh, sheep planes and wheel craft um, the the convention recognizes that it's, it's not always possible to hoist the flag on sheep planes um, of course um, the, the, this is uh, given in rule 31 um, the next relevant provisions that I see is the SORAS Convention. And in Chapter 5, uh, this chapter deals with safety of navigation. And specifically, Regulation 10 gives ship's routing. Um, ship's routing. Uh, this is uh, established by contracting governments i.e. not the IMO, it's, it's the government, individual state. The, they, they establish the ship's routing systems. And, and in some cases, some of the uh, ship's routing systems established are proposed and submitted to the IMO for adoption. 
mainly this is uh, something that requires the international attention and often um, located um, or quite an offshore, um, not certainly not in harbor, but uh, for example, the traffic separation schemes, which goes beyond of the um, of the coast beyond the territorial sea, then um, they are submitted to IMO for adoption. Um, the the picture that you see here is the one of the IMO um, publication that is ships routing, which disseminate all the previously um, adopted. Um, IMO adopted ships routing systems, including um, area to be avoided, and of course, uh, traffic separation schemes, recommended route, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there are certain rules that is also uh, giving already the guidance to um, SORAS gov um, contracting governments when they try to establish their own ships routing systems um, to, to follow. So it's it's uh, resolution A five seven two fourteen as amended. Uh, this gives uh, quite a comprehensive guidance to uh, contracting states, uh, contracting governments to to take into account. Um, the image and diagram of some of the um, actual previously adopted IMO uh, ship routing systems. Um, it's uh, not necessarily adopted by IMO. Um, it, in principle, this is up to the state concerned to make and um, to to, uh, to establish it uh, nationally and implement nationally. And um, according to the SORAS Convention, Rule 10 of Chapter 5, um, nothing um, prevents the state to establish such a uh, routing systems as well as area to be avoided within their territorial sea. And, and many states are doing that. As, and certainly if they are located in ports and harbors and internal waters, and uh, they, they, they don't need to be brought to the IMO for adoption. Um, basically the um, IMO member states um, establish um, nationally and implement nationally and um, all these established nationally established systems as well are uh, duly uh, uh, and depict and, and written and indicated in in the nautical chart um, and, and of course um, by um, by means also of notice to mariners the seafarers are duly um, notified of such an establishment. So um, there is a, a certain um, rules and, and recommendations which is applicable for states to do that. And, and we, we just have not um, have ha um, had any specific recommendations for states to consider when in when they establish the um, aerodromes at sea that is something that we may wish to consider in the future to to make us more specific recommend, um, recommendations to states when they establish such a uh, ship's routing system um, some other relevant circulars um, and this time for uh, weak craft, um, MSC1 circular 1592 adopted quite recently. It's, it's a comprehensive guidelines giving design, construction, as well as operational aspect of winging ground craft. And there are um, uh, software, i.e. The, the human software, the, the qualification of officers um, on, on winging ground and craft. Um, th these are uh recommended and, and and disseminated in msc circular 1162 um, approved in 2005 and um, just focusing on some important documents that i have 
um, um, introduced today. Um, there may be some other um, IMO documentations applicable um, to uh, the re relevant subject. So I'm just simply introducing the IMO website on, on our web IMO website uh, for uh, the documentation freely un um, downloadable as long as you register uh, free of charge. That's uh, what we call IMO docs. Right. Um, next, um, I have just introduced some um, legal aspect as well as procedural, um, to some extent, uh, procedural aspect of the subject. But um, because IMO exists to regulate uh, international shipping, um, this is um, something that may need to be followed by the IMO member state that I'm going to just briefly touch upon the procedure aspect. Um, the circular called MSC's dash MEPC.1 circ 5 currently revision 1. This gives the organization a method of work of Maritime Safety Committee and Marine Environment Protection Committee and their subsidiary bodies. What is uh, basically is saying that um, because there are um, quite a uh, um, um, wide spectrum of issues that IMO these committees cover, and and uh, it is increasingly becoming so that because of the um, time limitation or uh, limited time resources, um, there is a stringent control measure in place to allow MSC and MEPC to focus on priorities and not just one member state speaking, I want that. And, and then, um, of course, if it is important, then, then the committee will make a decision. Yes, indeed, this is important, needs to be considered to be a high priority and, and uh, require due attention. Uh, if it is not, then further explanation and justification will be required for a future session of a committee um, uh, in order to move forward. So uh, there is a, and this is quite a bulky document, but it gives the comprehensive um, um, details and requirements to the member states in order for, to, to submit the new proposal. So this is a, a very much a, um, recommended readings. Um, we do, however, um, uh, as uh, slightly um, briefly touched upon, um, a good working um, cooperation and collaboration with the ICAO, and, and this is one of the existing ones. The, we do have established a joint working group on harmonization of aeronautical and maritime search and rescue. And this meeting, typically meets every year. Typically, so far, um, we, we, we have um, organized 26 sessions and, and it has been um, considered as important and the requirement is duty, uh, sorry, requirement has been duly justified. So it, it's, it's almost like a, um, a permanent working group, but it's, it's, it's not permanent. It, it, they do meet every year because of the uh, continued requirement to continue to adopt and adjust and amend the existing measure for harmonization of aeronautical and maritime search and rescue. Um, <clears throat> working arrangement, um, somewhere in the middle of this slide, you will see that the subsidiary bodies should not develop amendment or interpretation or of any relevant IMO instrument without prior authorization or from a committee. So it's, it's, it's not allowed in a way to uh, bring this important issue 
to the attention of the subcommittee uh, level uh, without committee approving first. So again, there's a, a quite a stringent um, measure um, in place in order for the subcommittees or the subcommittees to uh, focus on the priority issues. Um, this uh, existing joint working group on harmonization of search and rescue is considered to be one of the intersessional working groups, which is established by the um, co parent committee at the endorsement of the council level. So uh, again, the committee itself cannot simply establish it. It has to be approved and endorsed by the council. Um, and any, um, and if, of course, if the requirements and justifications are duly made and acknowledged, the council and committee will be in the position to establish a new working group, um, joint um, sessions of, 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 of such an intercession working groups. Right. Um, this concludes my um, presentation. In the absence of any expertise or any knowledge, I, I must admit on the subjects that you're talking about um, from my perspective. But of course, IMO is there to, um, to assist the membership to, um, to, to create, establish, produce any required guidance requirement at the international level for the safety of uh, navigation, maritime safety, and marine environment protection purposes. And thank you uh, very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Asamo. Uh, very good presentation as well. Uh, so thank you very much, all our presenters, our guests today for their presentations. We have uh, heard and learned from uh, Indonesia, uh, which is actually representing the whole Asian Pacific region, where you've got a lot of experience in international uh, sea aviation. Uh, we have Canada. Thank you very much for this presentation. We have learned from you at the national level how it works or how it should work. That's very, very good presentation. And of course, with the IMO, since we are supposed to work together on this subject, uh, it's good to start to talk. That's why we have this platform and this was, it is good to talk with you. Okay, so the floor is open for Q&A. Any questions, any suggestions? Thierry? Please, good morning. Yes, good morning and thank you, Nabil. Thank you very much for the three speakers, speakers, sorry, because it was uh, really very interesting. And for me, honestly, I learned about, uh, a lot, <coughs> a lot of, uh, about <coughs> water, um, water aerodromes and, uh, and water uh, traffic, if I may say, air traffic. Uh, I just uh, want to, to ask some clarification questions to improve my awareness about this topic. Uh, the first one is uh, about uh, safety. Uh, it has been said that there is no safety standards for water aerodromes and water, uh, uh, water air uh, operations. Uh, but I suppose that in their respective uh, authorities, uh, the Indonesia or Canada, they, they assess the safety level of such operations. And I would like to know if they could give us uh, some information about the safety level of these uh, operations. So seaplanes operating from water aerodromes. The second question is about uh, <clears throat> the part of the international traffic in their respective uh, air uh, uh, water aerodromes just to, to be sure that uh, the international traffic is a made if is a significant part of the, of the traffic compared to the domestic one of course and, and the last one is for for imo because uh, you, you have insisted uh, on the weak craft and uh, for, for so i'm not familiar with this kind of uh, craft but i would like to know if a weak craft is obliged to take off for land on the on the water aerodrome before before flying. It's a very simple question. It's just to, to be aware of that. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Thierry. So from our guests, please, the floor is yours. I would like to, to answer these questions. OK, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, in response to the first question, I would like to uh, reiterate once again, as, I, uh, as we have mentioned earlier, that uh, until today, there is no global standard at international level that what we have is some uh, basic standard as applicable in some states. Uh, I think uh, this basic standard can uh, can can inform our our future works uh, if we really want to to develop a global standard. And on on the response of the question, I would like to invite my my colleague. Perhaps he uh, he is our expert on on technical matters. Fix, uh, you have the floor. Fix. Thank you, Mr. Pre Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. President. Thank you very much. I reiterate what uh, the ambassador said. That is correct. That is why we are uh, Indonesia and many other states are looking for a forum where they can develop the appropriate standards for water operations, whether it's within a harbor or whether it's within an open sea. I think somebody that can also add to it is, of course, Canada, because Canada has experience in this area. And they might have, because of the lack of global standards, they might have started developing their own standards to avoid to address this, this matter. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. I see Patrick Junot raising his hand. Jean. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, President. Um, so I'll attempt to answer the first two questions. So in terms of assessing the effectiveness, I think to Vic's point, uh, water aerodromes have played a water aerodromes have been key in connecting, you know, the vast geography of Canada for a long time. We've had these, we have them all over the place. Again, our context is a little bit different than, for example, Indonesia and many of the other states that spoke at the assembly and that most of our travel happens domestically, but it's, it's how we reach a lot of isolated and remote communities in Canada. It's how we meet and, and connect many communities that are isolated for much of the year. It's, it's the only way in is by air, be it by through a water aerodrome or sometimes a land aerodrome. Um, so we have a long history of these issues, which is what led Canada initially domestically to the development of the initial standards that we had and continues to drive us to need to sort of reconcile that piece. Um, we have some international transport out of Victoria and out of uh, Vancouver that happens for sure. Most of ours being domestic, but the need for those standards, the need to consider the realities of what a water aerodrome are or is, um, is what has pushed a lot of the development and 20 years of work in our area, in our country, in this area, because we recognize that there are issues. The issues aren't different. They're the same ones we see in many other places, but they happen in a very different context. Um, and for us to fail within Canada to address the water aerodrome, uh, need for aircraft certification for seaplane operations um, has been an issue for a long time that we're working to correct. It's, it's come up in many accident investigations within Canada, um, and it points out to the reality and the differences that exist between a seaplane and a land airplane. And I spoke a little bit of that in my presentation, but uh, when we talk about smaller airplanes that are often used for regional transport within Canada, these are airplanes, and when they have an accident on water, they flip. So they, they flip and that's led us to having to re-examine our standards around how we uh, mandate the wearing of life vests, for example, on those, on those planes, that we require our pilots to be trained in egress training, uh, something that you would never ask for a, for a land aerodrome operator and somebody who only operates from land because of that reality. Um, we've spoken to, we've had investigations where you speak to these people after the fact, and it's, it's such a startling reality to all of a sudden have the entire plane flipped over and to try to assist the evacuation of passengers that there are specific needs around seaplane operations. There are specific needs around standards for those pieces, to the provision of training to people that operate in that environment. And those needs aren't unique to Canada. We're not the only one with water aerodromes. In the international context, and, and to the second piece around international traffic and water aerodromes, I can speak for Canada, we do have some international connections that do operate through water aerodromes. But I've also traveled. I've been to the Caribbean. I've been to other places like that where international traffic from water aerodrome from one water aerodrome to another does and can and does happen and i speak back to that idea of, of from an ico perspective we felt it necessary at the time to create an annex and standards around land aerodromes because of the idea of a pilot taking off in one country and landing in another country to ensure safety needed consistency of application needed to know what he would be facing what an indicator looks like what a runway approach looks like how to sort of navigate that piece and that's led to the great safety gains that we have and the safety of the aviation system that we have today. Um, but I, I submit that that's a gap that remains today for water aerodromes. And as we see many of these states developing, and we see traffic increasing, 
we see exploiting more and more because land is at a premium, especially in island states. There's often just not enough room to build a large enough aerodrome or it's very limited and water provides an opportunity to do that. And as we see that continue to grow, the longer we wait to move into that area and to sort of assure that safety, potentially the bigger that problem may grow as time goes. And that's why we're saying we have 20 years of experience. It's a very big reality for Canada. We are more than happy to put that on the table and share that and, and help ICAO make ground on this, but make it very quickly so that we're not starting from scratch, but that we've got a base to build upon. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there was a, there was a comprehensive question regarding the, the, the wing craft, wing and ground crafts. Uh, if you have to take off from land, if I understood this well from Thierry, uh, I think the question was to Mr. Osamu or to anyone from the presenters. Mr. Osamu, would you, would you like to take this question? Um Thank you for the question to IMO. However, um, as I have um, said, um, explained that uh, um, I'm not the expert on that. Uh, we do have uh, produced the guidance, um, but, but as far as I know, I understand there's no legal obligation um, that is applicable to the wing wing graph um, and for that, uh, there is a guidance. Um, I'm sure that the uh, many of the panel members here is is far better uh, in far better position to answer to that question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. So, okay. So, uh, well, it is anyway a discussion. So feel free uh, uh, if we have an expert with us today here, or if someone would like to add uh, anything. It's it's a talk. It's a discussion. Okay. Uh, part of that, let me uh, give the floor, please, to to other. Uh, uh, speakers, questioners. So I have uh, the first the first one is uh, Subash. Good morning, Subash. Uh, good morning, Mr. President. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a very interesting presentation. I, I, I'd like to thank the presenters for their uh, presentations and what they have said about the requirements for water drone. Uh, I also know that there are other relevant streams of work in IMO uh, with regards to uh, best, uh, well, vessels that have the ability to fly. And I sense also that perhaps some of the IQ provisions that are already available for land aerodromes or helicopters may also be applicable to the water aerodromes. So maybe in order to go forward in a proper way, we should get the IQ secretariat to map up what are the existing provisions uh, that can be applied what are the guidance that are already available in IMO and other expert groups? And then we should uh, identify what are the gaps and of these which should, could be undertaken by IQ uh, for international civil aviation. I think, I, think I, I, I sense that there is a growing usage for uh, seaplanes uh, as, uh, as, as uh, of course, as the economy and the wealth of the uh, nations grow. And I think using seaplanes is, is, is very economical, especially when you have uh, multiple islands like Indonesia or Maldives or you know, Philippines. So I think we should do a gap analysis and then identify which areas that IQ should play a role, especially in the facilitation of international survey aviation. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, uh, Subash. Uh, let's have uh, more uh, more speakers. Uh, Albano is the next one, then Swami, please. Good morning, can you hear me? Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning to everybody, to all the participants. Uh, a warm uh, warm greetings from, <clears throat> from Montreal, here from the IKO HQ. Um, this has been obviously a very interesting uh, ANC talk again, and uh, I have, you know, I, have, I cannot stop uh, saying that if there was any doubt, uh, this this ANC talk is definitely uh, a, a, a proof that this is a, a very important uh, new step that the ANC has taken, and of course I have to congratulate Nabil for uh, taking the initiative of, of creating this um, this new 
model for interaction between ICAO and uh, I mean the industry, the, straight, the stakeholders anyway, the, the people that we are working for here in ICAO. And this is a, definitely an area that we can see that there is work to be done and somehow we must find a way to um, introduce this uh, water aerodrome issue in, in our work program so that we can come up with some some you know some solutions for the problems that have been presented here i mean uh, it's obvious that uh, there's work to be done of coordination between ICAO and the IMO because we're talking of a common environment but definitely there's definitely work to be done by, by the NC in, in, in the production of standards for this this specific type, type of operation. Uh, I, would, I won't have any questions, but I'd just like to, to ask, please. Uh, I was following with a lot of interest the, the, the presentations. Uh, I've seen them before the session, and I noticed that the, the Canadian presentation is slightly different from the one we have uh, been provided before. It's more complete, it's got a few more slides. So if at some point it will be possible to have it, I would very much appreciate it. Even that I, I'm, we've got uh, an ex-colleague of ours here in the commission who is actually a, a seaplane owner and he will be quite interested. He couldn't join us because he couldn't, he couldn't log in uh, for some for some reason, but he's quite interested in the in the subject. So it would be nice for us, for all of us to have the updated presentation from, from Canada. Thank you very much again for the for the initiative and to the for the, the three presenters. Uh, thank you very much for taking time from your busy agendas to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albano, uh, and uh, thank you for your kind words. Uh, yes, indeed, we have received the updated uh, presentation from Canada uh, during the weekend. Uh, all presentations will be uploaded in our secret portal. Thank you very much. Swami, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Interesting presentations. Uh, of course, I mean, like, uh, it's, it's still work in progress. And uh, in fact, uh, during the uh, assembly, we had some interaction with the Canadian delegation. And one point of interest for India was uh, the water aerodromes. Uh, the DGCA India has already issued a car. I just went through the sample regulations of ICAO and also the general operating and flight rules, which is a document uh, of the Canadian uh, uh, federal government. Uh, I, ha I have one question. In most of these documents, it is very minimally, uh, I mean, regarding water aerodromes, it, it talks very minimally about the aerodrome control part of the air traffic control. Because the, the, the Indian car also talks about if it is within a control zone, whatever is applicable, the terms and conditions of you know operating within a control zone would apply to these aircraft. The sample regulations hardly talks about it. Again, briefly mentions about the air traffic control, the ICAO sample regulations. The general and operating, uh, general operating and flight rules of the of the Canadian regulation talks a little bit more. But my my question is, uh, if the uh, presenter from Canada can just throw more light on, you know, are they contemplating on something in terms of suppose they establish an aerodrome control for a licensed water aerodrome? Uh, of course, I mean probably now the traffic density is not such that you would have something like that. But if it is done. Uh, will it require some very specialized training for the air traffic controllers? Because, I mean, he also made an interesting point about the egress. And, I mean, there is, there is a whole different uh, uh, set of actions, like, you know, which normally an aerodrome controller will not be otherwise exposed to. So are they looking in terms of the ATC training requirements? That's my question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Swami, for this uh, good question. I think it was to... Uh... So Patrick, you know? Patrick, please. Thank you, President. Um, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to answer that question at the moment. I would say it's on the table and it's something that we're exploring. I'd say like our standards are still in the final sort of rulemaking process. They go hand in hand um, with multiple pieces. But one of the questions that we continue to struggle with on our end is, is less about the technical requirements of the standards but more about the applicability and how far are we going and applying them. And I think it's, it speaks to one of the point that, uh, one of the points that uh, was raised in the question was, we don't necessarily want to apply the same standards for a very busy water aerodrome uh, that we would to a very small water aerodrome. And so that's, that's one of the pieces we're still sort of debating is exactly how far we go with the application of that piece. And I would hazard that as part of the work that would need to be done and an ICAO level on this piece is, is part of that international consensus as to where do we draw that line 
And at one point, we start incorporating that element into the air traffic control piece as well. Um, I know that within Canada, we sort of struggle with where we're going to draw that line and, and we continue to think about that piece. And, and I hope to finalize that in the coming while so that we can finally publish the final rule. But it's, it's where do we draw that line? Uh, we have some very, very busy water aerodromes, like I was talking about around Vancouver Harbor, in which we were already doing that to a certain extent. And we would have to formalize that in some way. But there are other places where if you're only having a movement or a few movements a day, perhaps you need to think about it in a little bit of a different context. But I think for the context that we're talking about today, in terms of those international movements, a lot of those water aerodromes would be quite busy. Or if you're accepting traffic from another place, you probably need to be thinking about that and how do we incorporate that. So I, I would hazard or put forward that that would be one of the considerations that would need to be worked through at an ICAO level as well. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much. Before I give the floor to, to Caps, just just an observation from from my side uh, to your question, Swami. So since we have learned today that uh, the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, that was signed in 1974, has established kind of a limit between ICAO and IMO uh, responsibilities. We have learned that below 150 meter, it is the responsibility of the IMO and 100 so i can i could imagine now i can imagine that uh, for 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 the question there would be a kind of combined work between air traffic controllers and sea traffic controllers like the ones we know after landing at the airport so you switch to another uh, uh, code so kind of kind of that but a good question and a good area to work together with IMO. look forward for that thank you uh, the next speaker is caps Good morning, can Captain. I can I say something, President? Uh, sure, sure. Excuse me, Ambassador, please. I will be very brief. Uh, in response to the idea of having a gap analysis, as indicated earlier, I think uh, Indonesia is uh, greatly welcome with uh, the idea because uh, we think uh, might be good for uh, for us if we can identify some existing IQ provision which may be relevant to the seaplanes. And then at the same time, we also work on to, to identify some relevant provision in IQ regime, sorry, in IMO regime. And uh, of course, uh, as you mentioned earlier, collaborative work between the two institutions, uh, the two international organizations might be very important. And then uh, I think uh, this is a one issue that uh, one idea that we, uh, that INC should take into consideration in deciding the mandate of the panel if uh, the INC decide to do so. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, okay, uh, Caps has been waiting. Caps, please, good morning. Good morning, Mr. President, and um, good morning, everyone. A uh, special thank you to the presenters um, like the rest who have spoken before me, uh, this is for me education. I learned a lot. I've seen aircraft landing on water uh, and uh, just, just fascinated. I didn't know uh, this much information about them. So I'm grateful. Um, my observation is almost on the point you made. Uh, the SOLAS convention, which apportions responsibilities to IKO and responsibilities to IMO. And of course, I have no doubt that the membership of IKO is almost the same. It's, it's basically largely the same states who are members to both. I want to thank the presenters also for highlighting the plight of uh, small islands uh, in the framework of no country left behind, uh, especially for Canada. You are not one of those left behind. So I'm so very happy that you have picked this idea and highlighted it. And uh, you have made a very good case uh, together with Indonesia, uh, an economic case for disciplines and planes operations. You have also made a good case that there is need for global standardization or global standards to um, regulate 
and ensure that uh, these seaplane operations are safe. Because if they are not safe, then it becomes difficult to to uh, contribute to contribute to the economic development of those small islands. Since the membership is almost the same, I have one question. Um, this dialogue, this conversation, is it also taking place in the IMO? In fact, I had this question even before the presentation of, of IMO. And uh, when the presenter said he was not aware of this particular challenge, then now my question sort of was answered, but I still want to know whether there is a conversation of similar nature taking place in IMO, or whether in light of that SOLAS convention of 1974, it is not necessary that this conversation is also, is also started in IMO uh, organization. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Cubs. Uh, Mr. Osamu, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and and thank you, um, distinguished um, participant, um, on on the topic. Um, I I have two issues here. Um, the, the first one, if I may, before I I um, respond to the question of the um, IMO awareness of the issue. Um, also, this is also um, in, in, with regard to the IMO awareness, but the SORAS Convention 1974, um, I'm hearing um, the presentation from the distinguished uh, participant of uh, His Excellency from Indonesia, um, 150 meter rule uh, above and below and below is the IMO responsibility. This is something that I have not, uh, at least I'm not aware of, um, of, of such uh, um, an important decision that may have been made. Uh, is it something that you see in the conference resolution where the SORAS uh, 1974 was adopted? Or is, um, I am aware that's nowhere in the uh, actual provision, regulations of SORAS Convention in its annex, um, and, and specifically for, for Chapter 5, there's no such uh, decision um, prescribed in, in the IMO instrument. If I could uh, have the clarification on that, that would be appreciated. On, and the second issue uh, that we have just heard about the IMO awareness, of the important issue of the um, aerodrome and at sea. I have been serving in the IMO Secretariat for nearly 14 years, and I, and I haven't heard any state or even the um, um, international organizations bringing this important issue to the attention of the wider IMO membership. There is, of course, the opportunity and to present uh, such an, an issue to the IMO. Um, and, and there may have been some documentation submitted uh, to the IMO uh, organs for information only. Um, basically, if you submitted information, these information will be noted. And, and it basically stops there, unless otherwise some other influence countries and organizations um, submits the proposal for future consideration. And so far, we are not hearing anything from anyone, um, apart from this very interesting discussion that, uh, and it's, it's, it's a um, privilege for me I'd to like be to able to become aware does. of this important but so often, issue. It all comes um, down to but at the same time, uh, it, again, as I have also already presented, it is the prerogative of the IMO membership, i.e. the member states, which need to bring this to the attention of the IMO decision-making body, more specifically the Maritime Safety Committee. And once it is just duty-wide, and, and they will make a clear instruction to its subsidiary body, most likely the uh, 
navigation, communication, and search and rescue uh, subcommittee to uh, make um, further um, um, progress on, on that matter. And, and any possible um, joint uh, um, establishment, um, joint drafting um, between um, IKO and an IMO, of course, will have to be considered first by the Maritime Safety Committee level. Um, and uh, of course, um, the, the, the um, window is open. So any IMO member states can submit such a proposal uh, so that committee, first of all, becomes aware of such an important issue. And, and so that um, we can take uh, more um, proactive action uh, uh, with the wider maritime committee, community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I have, uh, I see three blue hands. Okay, first, uh, Mr. Patrick Junot, then Chris, then Sasha. Thank you, President. Um, I, I appreciate the colleagues, of, uh, the comments of my colleague from IMO as well. I would say that you know Canada as a member of both ICAO and IMO is, is something that absolutely we recognize the need for integration across the two organizations on something that cuts across the mandates of both organizations as well. Um, I, I recognize the question about the applicability of SOLAS, which was drafted in 1974. But I would caution from my perspective of saying was, was the context in which we drafted SOLAS in 1974 still the context in which we operate today 50 years later. Um, a lot of things have changed. We've seen a growth in terms of island states. We've seen a growth in the need for connection and air connections to other places and the growth of, of connections that are international in nature that touch on water aerodromes. And so I think when we ask these questions, we need to ask them in the modern context of today. And if I can draw a parallel, um, it's in another part of my job, I'm also responsible for determining how we do commercial space launch in Canada. And I know that that's an issue where ICAO continues to struggle with you and COPUS on the same types of questions of the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, or the UN Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, the Outer Space Treaty, the interface with the Chicago Convention and who controls airspace and the integration of rockets into that airspace when you have different modes transacting in the same context. I think it's the same questions that we struggle with is, is how does ICAO play in that space and how does UN COPUS play in the space? I think it's the same type of working together um, to resolve these issues that we need to do between ICAO and IMO because we have the same types of parallels of an overlap of two spaces that need to be reconciled as well. But I think we need to go at that from a modern context in terms of the problem we're looking at today, which is a growth of a sector, a growing safety need, and a need to, to reconcile between the two organizations to make sure that we come out with something that serves all member states and all people equally as well. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? No, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and a uh, uh, pleasure to be on this call. I just wanted to add to the comments of my colleague uh, from IMO, Mr. Maramoto, uh, uh, and, and, and also uh, note uh, with some happiness, actually, that there doesn't appear to be any lawyers on this call. Um, and I say that facetiously because the differentiation between uh, the authorities with respect to the conventions uh, that IMO is responsible for and the convention that uh, ICAO is responsible for is, is quite complicated uh, to the extent that uh, after the drafting and uh, adoption of some conventions, there have been letters of clarification subsequently to confirm uh, the responsibilities and authorities. And perhaps if we talk to legal bureau at some time in the future, that, that can be sorted out. Uh, um, and it could be actually quite a good learning experience for all of us. Um, on, on the issue of coordination uh, between ICAO and IMO, it's, it's the same with any other specialized agency or without actually any authority outside of uh, ICAO. And, and the normal process in this sort of instance would be that ICAO would start doing work uh, on a particular work program item. And then subsequently, when it is determined that coordination with any outside agency is necessary, that coordination takes place. Um, and of course, sometimes 
um, the work is done together. Uh, I don't see this as being one of those examples, but we do have a joint working group on search and rescue, um, uh, which we work on uh, search and rescue together. So there's different ways of doing the coordination uh, between specialised agencies. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, Sasha, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Nabil, and uh, good morning to all. And uh, thank you again to all the speakers uh, for this uh, wonderful, th for this interesting uh, presentations. And uh, actually, my question uh, relates to the same issue, which is which has been just discussed about the coordination uh, between, uh, on the issue of the overlapping mandates of uh, ICAO and uh, IMO. And uh, I well remember that uh, before, prior to the 40th Assembly, uh, when Indonesia uh, was initiating uh, the working paper about the importance of the regulation of water aerodromes, uh, this working paper uh, was finally submitted, uh, I believe, uh, by, together by Indonesia and Canada and supported by uh, other member states. Uh, so, uh, further to these initiatives, uh, I have the question to the, to the ambassador of uh, Indonesia, your honor. Uh, does uh, Indonesia uh, propose the same initiatives uh, within the IMO? I mean, do you, uh, have you submitted maybe any working papers or something like that? Thank you. Thank you, sir. sir. Uh, Ambassador, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, if I may directly respond to you that uh, to this point, uh, we, 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 we still begin our work and our endeavor focusing on, 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 on IQ because we believe that the IQ should play a very important role on, on this matter. But uh, having said that, it, uh, in the future, of course, as I mentioned in my 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 presentation, that we are, we are very willing to to assist and to facilitate the discussion and the negotiation in IMO forums uh, to to achieve uh, this collaborative work between IMO and IQ. So this is a uh, this is our commitment, and I think uh, there are many uh, this commitment I, I believe would be shared by by many other uh, council members uh, countries in IMO. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Young, good morning. Good morning, uh, Nabil. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nabil, for this opportunity. And uh, thank you to all the uh, presenters for uh, very good presentations. I remember working with you during the assembly on uh, working paper 94. Uh, I worked with Patrick, I uh, worked with uh, uh, experts from uh, uh, Indonesian delegation. And uh, uh, we ended up with uh, an assembly resolution. Uh, uh, it was a long story. We had a lot of coordination, but it was good. Um, just to give you a little bit more information uh, about the uh, 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 this domain from, from ICAL perspective, uh, uh, I think it might be useful, uh, uh, especially uh, Subash mentioned the uh, gap analysis and so on and so forth. Uh, actually, we did have SARPs for water aerodromes back in 1958. And uh, those SARPs lasted for a few years until uh, 1964, I believe. Um, uh, I guess it was because of the low demand for international uh, uh, standardization and the, uh, it was decided to remove uh, the SARPs from Annex 14 and put it in a manual. Uh, it was uh, Airdromes Manual Part 7, Water Airdromes. And it stayed there for a few more years. Uh, in 1978, it was removed from the manual even. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, we need to dig into the history. I did uh, a few years ago. Uh, I think my conclusion was uh, at that time was uh, sort of a low demand for this business and uh, nobody wanted to maintain the uh, currency of the standards or uh, guidance material even. Uh, okay, having said that, uh, seems to me uh, uh, more and more traffic, uh, uh, you know, using seaplanes um, 
are happening uh, throughout the world, especially in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and, and actually, uh, we supported an initiative in that region about uh, developing a sample regulation on water aerodromes. If you uh, look at the uh, Asia Pacific website of ICAO, you could find a sample regulation on water aerodromes. Uh, it was published a few years ago. And of course, uh, from uh, a legal point of view, I don't think that's uh, something like annex or pens or even guidance material. It is an ICAO document, uh, but it is not mandatory. Uh, that sample regulation does give uh, some guidance on how to certify water aerodromes, um, but of course, doesn't give all the technical details about, uh, for example, physical characteristics, visual aids, uh, obstacle limitation surfaces for water aerodromes. And if you look at Annex 14, interestingly, uh, the definition of aerodromes does include water aerodromes. And uh, in another uh, paragraph, I guess, in the foreword, it does talk about chapter three, which is uh, physical characteristics that is uh, applied to land aerodromes only. So technically speaking, apart from chapter three, physical characteristics, all the other chapters, including obstacles, uh, rescue firefighting, visual aids, etc., could technically apply to water aerodromes. But I personally don't think states can directly apply all those standards uh, to their water aerodromes. Uh, that's why in Annex 14, you do have a provision that says uh, uh, it's up to states to decide how you reference the existing uh, specifications in Annex 14.1. So it's, it's really up to the states. It's uh, based on their discretion. They could, what I understand that could happen is that uh, if one state wants to regulate the water air drills at the moment without international standards, they could look to Annex 14 uh, chapters, except for chapter three, and make adjustments as necessary because there are similarities between land aerodromes and water aerodromes in terms of visual aids, uh, for example, in terms of uh, the colors, so the patterns of the lighting, markings, uh, in terms of the uh, obstacle limitation surfaces. But you do have to study your own situation, try to use those standards um, wisely. Uh, having said that, I, I do think, you know, uh, given the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, first in this domain, uh, uh, we need to do something about it. That I, we had a resolution, and I need to remind the commission that uh, after the, uh, the assembly, the commission has done the prioritization exercise because this water aerodrome uh, item belongs to one of those items that are not um, funded, to be strictly uh, speaking, uh, because it was not included in the uh, work program of the current uh, triennium. Uh, so it, it is one of those uh, pending uh, resources, I guess, uh, that, you know, uh, we, we were using that term. And uh, the commission did uh, do a prioritization ex exercise. Uh, uh, I think I remember it's in the middle of the list uh, for water air drones. It's, it's not really a very high priority. Uh, it's not uh, at the bottom of the list. It's sort of a little bit lower than uh, the average or it's sort of average, I would say. So uh, frankly speaking, uh, and uh, we have been discussing this, it is, uh, uh, in our radar, it is uh, included in the uh, working paper for the, for the council. Uh, I, I think uh, um, um, I don't think it's a, uh, you know uh, time to discuss in detail about the technical work uh, at this meeting. But I, what I'm trying to say is that um, uh, today, this presentations uh, give me a lot more information. Thank you for that, uh, especially uh, in the context of IMO. I do agree with Chris that in this specific case, uh, the expertise with regard to water aerodromes rests with ICAO mainly. I, I think uh, when it comes to coordination with IMO, I think it is essential to coordinate with uh, IMO. Uh, I am thinking of examples like a, uh, WMO. We have a 
a representation from WMO on our net panel, and uh, they bring their uh, expertise to the panel and uh, the the main body of of, of the map uh, of the uh, map related work. Uh, 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 the main body of uh, responsible for map related work is the map panel. I'm not saying uh, we were you know uh, we we know how we co coordinate with IMO, but I do see that technically the main issue here is the interface, you know, between the seaplane and other vessels, because uh, according to my understanding now, uh, below 150 meters, uh, you know, the maneuvering of the uh, seaplane on the water surface, uh, you know, is regarded as a sort of a, a vessels, you know, movement. In that regard, I, I do think uh, I saw this um, uh, regulation uh, from IMO uh, regarding the uh, uh, collision avoidance. I think that interface needs to be addressed. How are you going to go about uh, avoid collision with other vessels and the ships on the sea level? I think that, that is the, uh, from a technical point of view, the main issue we need to coordinate, uh, coordinate with, uh, um, uh, with IMO. But in terms of air traffic issue, that's really something else. I, I think uh, Chris, you know, is looking at that. Chris, I think, answered that question very well. Uh, I guess that's all I, I think I, I should offer uh, for this meeting to just give you additional information from ICAL perspective. Uh, uh, thanks again for the presentations, and I think we work very well in the assembly. I, I, I look forward to, uh, you know, our future cooperation. Thank you, Nabil. Thank you very much, Yong. Thank you very much. Good additions to our discussion today. Okay. Um, can we respond, uh, Mr. President? Yes. Uh, just a reminder, we got almost two, three minutes more. We'll, brief. we'll be very brief. Please. Thank Basel. you very much. Well, but, you know, I'm surprised that ICAOs thought this not to be important and put it down the importance list towards the bottom. But being having said that, let's explain. And I don't want to go through the whole uh, presentation again. I, there's two airports that I can mention that between the two operates a million people a year. So that's already a safety factor. We've looked at a picture at some of the airports where you are mixing aircraft with boats, different frequencies, different procedures. This is why it's such an important thing for Indonesia, Canada, if I may speak for them and other countries, that's a very important, especially where it's taking off and you're looking at aircraft that at the moment is the size of an Airbus 320, you have jets operating in the water with 70 plus passengers, etc. There are no global standards. All that we are asking, with all due respect to ICAO, there are no water experts in ICAO. That's why we would try, Indonesia is trying to recommend a panel with water experts working under the supervision of ICAO to design, develop, because this is an important issue. We cannot push it further. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, t t thank you very much, Vic. Uh, your comments are very well noted, and uh, I think when uh, my colleague and me will start to work on the privatization of the items, uh, so we will we will consider uh, how to how to deal with this with this issue too, in a in a good time. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I I had Thierry, but I also had Mr. John Puttinger. I don't know if. Mr. Puttinger would like to add something quickly before I give the floor to Thierry. Yes, if I could quickly, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thanks for doing this. Bapa uh, Ambassador Yang uh, Hormat, Bapa Ambassador Dan Selamat Sien di Montreal. So, Istri Saya Orang Indonesia. So, just briefly, um, some of you know that uh, my company conducted that study you saw the slides of that resulted in Victoria and Vancouver procedures. Um, I'm Canadian, but I also have lived and worked extensively in Indonesia. So my only comment is that I'm really, really happy that it's Indonesia and Canada that are partnering, Mr. President, with you and with ICAO, because these are the two countries that really do have the experience and want the experience. and and are much more similar than, than some think. Indonesia is a huge country and the domestic um, uh, uh, ability to, to use water aerodromes will be able to be shown in Indonesia 
and used as an example all over the world. So I just wanted to say how, uh, how appreciative I am that uh, you guys are all working on this. It's important, it needs to be done. And thank you again, Mr. President, thank you. Prima Kastin, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Mr. Pottinger. Thank you very much. Okay, Thierry, a few seconds. Yeah, thank you, Nabil. Very quickly, in fact, uh, it was just a comment because uh, uh, you have said that uh, maybe the NC will handle this, this subject. But anyway, I think we, we need to have an idea of the criticality of the problems. Uh, if I take, for instance, the slide number 15 uh, from uh, our Canadian friends, there is a list of topics that are now embedded in the Canadian standards, but I think that we have to, have a, to, 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 have, to address these topics, but with a, a priority list, if I may say, because as you know, uh, the resources are scarce. So it's important to, to make a kind of priority so that we, we, we could work. Uh, we have heard that interface is a problem. We have heard that, uh, uh, how to say, the density of the traffic between the ships and, uh, air, and airplanes are also a problem. So, it's important to have in mind what, where are the main problems, the major problems, so that uh, the gap analysis mentioned by Subach could be easier to perform. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank, thank, you uh, thank you very much, uh, Thierry. Just to clarify, what, what I'm talking about is that we have an assembly resolution. So, and that's happened during the last assembly. And, you know, we have our cycle of work to develop the SARPs. So this, this resolution will go there. This resolution is about specific SARPs. So there's design, certification, management, the safety and the reporting requirements for water aerodromes operations. Okay, so that will take it away. And uh, of course, uh, with the, our uh, colleagues from the Secretariat, we'll work on that to address uh, this issue in an appropriate time. That is what I believe. Thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, well, as you have seen, it is a very exciting uh, subject we're discussing today. Um, and don't forget, we, we, we just tried actually to, to, to cover the, the safety issues. So we, we, we have not spoken about security issues in, in the kind of, of operations. And I liked pretty much the, the comments uh, highlighting that, well, uh, it was in the past. It was, it was, it was an exciting subjects in the, in the past, um, the country I'm most familiar with, we, we were building aircrafts so in the, in the south. So it's not just about islands somewhere. It can also be in the middle of a continent where the mountains are, uh, where you cannot maybe build an, an, an aerodrome. It will be expensive, but you have a sea close. So you have already your, 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 your aerodrome. So many, many things. Uh, I would be, uh, of course, uh, more than happy to, to have this discussion uh, uh, with, with you, with the, with the colleagues, uh, when we will be reviewing that assembly resolution and the out, that, uh, that outcome, and to, to think how, how, to, how to deal with it, also with our experts in the panels. So it's, it's very good, and I thank everyone for, for being here today. It's good to have this kind of, of informal discussions to learn from each other. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ambassador, thank you, Indonesia, Vic. Thank you very much, Patrick Juno. Thank you, IMO, Mr. Samo. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I will see my guests, so the speakers, at in 15 minutes. So you have you have received that invitation just just to, to talk to you five minutes more. And uh, for uh, our colleagues, so thank you very much. Uh, see you tomorrow in the NC chamber for the opening of the session. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.